So today we begin a new worship series on the Divine Feminine by considering the figure of Mary, the mother of Jesus. Now, as with most theological constructs, this topic is far too broad to be seriously covered in a sermon or even a series of sermons. The lens through which we will consider the Divine Feminine today, Mary, the Mother of Jesus, is a very small lens, and we're even going to see a small part of that. Depending on who you ask, Mary may or may not be considered a divine figure. Although a person might engage in certain ritualistic or devotional practices, it is inaccurate to say that she is worshipped as a goddess. For example, someone might pray to Mary to intercede with God on their behalf, but that isn't the same as worshiping her. It's more accurate to say that devotion to Mary is a means through which one might worship God. This distinction, although theologically important, is, is minor to non-existent in the hearts of those who engage in Marian <laughs> devotion. And for this reason, I think that it's reasonable for us to put Mary in the pantheon of our divine feminine. You know, there isn't actually a whole lot about Mary in the Gospels. In fact, there's more about Mary in the Quran than there is in the Bible. <laughs> Most of Mary's dialogue in the Bible is in the infancy narratives about Jesus, and of course those are only in two of the four Gospels. Her longest dialogue is found in the Gospel according to Luke. After learning that she will give birth, she sings a hymn of praise. <laughs> praising God for uplifting the downtrodden and casting down the rich and the powerful. And from this, we are to know that Mary is on the side of the poor and the outcast, she herself being an unwed, pregnant teenager of humble origins. <clears throat> there are a handful of other accountings of Mary's interactions with Jesus throughout the Gospels, including one mention that she was present at the crucifixion. But despite a rather paltry role in the Christian scriptures, Mary plays a deeply important role in the devotional lives of millions of people. She is arguably most venerated in Catholicism, but she also holds special status in Orthodox Christianity, Anglicanism, Lutheranism, Islam, and other folk traditions. A wealth of folklore, mythology, and devotional practices have sprung up around her character and the role that she played in Jesus' life. And there's arguably no place on earth where this is more evident than Israel and Palestine. Several years ago, I had the good fortune to visit the Holy Lands as part of a divinity school class. And while we were in Nazareth, we visited the Basilica of the Annunciation. It was essentially a shrine to Mary and a center of Marian devotion. Worshiping communities from around the world have sent beautiful, handmade, ginormous art that de <laughs> depicting Mary. And as I walked around the courtyard in the narthex of the building, I couldn't help but notice that each depiction of Mary was a depiction of the culture that had made the art. The Mary from Thailand was Thai. The Mary from Spain was Spanish. The Mary from Indonesia looked an awful lot like Angelina Jolie, but I think that was a coincidence. <laughs> I have pictures, I will show you. <laughs> so as I wandered around this holy place, taking in the efforts of humanity to respond to something that is beyond us, I was struck by how impossible it is for us to do that. We can't have ideas of God or the divine that are not our ideas. Our ability to think beyond our human existence does not exist. We can't augment our thinking to perceive the ineffable. All we can do is keep churning out ideas of what might be. When we portray the divine in human terms, sometimes as who we are, and sometimes as what we aspire to be because that's all we can do. Mary has become a symbol for certain human qualities, for grace, 
mercy, compassion, and patience. Although the Gospels provide limited information about her in each instance that she is mentioned, those are the qualities that are the connecting thread. She is the embodiment of grace, mercy, compassion, and patience. And when she appears in the Gospels, it is to bring those qualities to the unfolding story. Remember that the Gospels are deep, rich storytelling at its best, and every character serves a narrative purpose. As I've been considering our own Unitarian Universalist narrative, I thought about the role of grace, mercy, compassion, and patience. I think we could do better with those qualities. As you use, we tend to fall very heavily on one side of the issues. And in our rush to get it right, we are quick to distance ourselves from those who have gotten it wrong. And over the years, we have adopted what the young people call cancel culture. In cancel culture, when someone says or does something offensive, they get canceled, meaning that we cut them out, we shun them, we pretend they never existed. Here are some examples for you. Kevin Spacey is canceled. <laughs> Bill Cosby, canceled. Jeffrey Epstein, double canceled. <laughs> Now, I stand by all three of those people being canceled, because what they did was a pattern of abusive predatory behavior. That's what canceling should be used for. Unitarian Universalism, however, is a covenantal religious tradition, which means that our relationships make us who we are. I have no interest in maintaining covenantal relationships with people who are not interested in living within a covenant. I'll be very clear about that. Those examples that I gave are extreme examples of people that, again, I think should be canceled, but I use them because they are familiar. Canceling is a strong reaction that should be, that should be reserved for those extreme circumstances. And always, I hold out hope for some kind of redemption at some time. What I'm concerned about, what I want to talk about today, is the idea of canceling people for small events. I worry that we lose people from Unitarian Universalism because they are afraid that they are going to say or do the wrong thing and get canceled. Or that people stay in our congregations but refuse to engage in the work of expanding our welcome, perhaps even pushing back against that because they are afraid of being canceled. UU churches do a lot of work around inclusion, specifically racial equality, LGBTQ plus identities, classism, disabilities. This means learning about how our behavior might impact those who are not like us, and that is hard. That requires vulnerability and risk taking, and it inevitably means getting it wrong, because that's how we learn. In learning, even the willingness to try to learn is stifled by fear. The fear that we will be rejected or canceled for making a mistake. I was already planning on preaching about this subject today when we had the perfect example come up in last week's service. A much beloved member of our congregation made a joke. It was offensive to our LGBTQ folks. We talked about this earlier. He didn't know it was offensive. He didn't mean to hurt anybody. People approached me about the issue. I encouraged them to talk to them, talk to him directly about their feelings and concerns. And I planned to talk to him myself. He listened to those concerns. He learned why it was hurtful. He took responsibility. He apologized. And now we can move on with a lesson learned about how to be better friends and neighbors to each other. This is exactly what we're trying to do here in Unitarian Universal. One of the things that I like most about BUC's covenant is that it includes a mechanism for repairing our relationships after a breach. Covenant is printed on the back of your order of service. It's there every week, just so you know. <laughs> I invite you to turn to it if you'd like and read along. The first three statements of our covenant, I will strive to be my best self in all my interactions 
assume the best intentions of everyone's actions, be mindful of our shared humanity and my communications, or about how we say and come out. The last statement is about how we mend things when necessary. I will pause, reflect, and be part of the solution when things go awry. Because things will go awry. It's a rule, it has to sometimes. And I think that the natural setting for many of us would be cause things to go awry is to freak out, deny, and run away. But this covenant, our covenant, holds us together when there is a problem, which is kind of brilliant. Breaking covenants is inevitable. When we are actually engaging in the work of being more inclusive rather than avoiding difficult, unfamiliar, and uncomfortable things, we are opening ourselves up to making mistakes. So when someone tells us that we hurt them, they've actually done us a great favor. They're giving us an opportunity to grow. We'll never get it right unless someone is willing to tell us that we got it wrong. And we owe a debt of gratitude to people who can stay in covenant with us and give us the opportunity to pause, reflect, and be part of the solution. And something else that I love about this last line of our covenant is it doesn't actually say who is supposed to pause, reflect, and be part of the solution. And I suspect that this vagueness was intentional. I know some of you probably wrote this covenant. I have not been paid to say this. I don't actually know who wrote it. <laughs> I know it was the Committee on Ministry years ago, but I think it's really great. It was when we've been hurt. I think many of us, instead of pause, reflect, and be part of the solution, we get mad, we blame, and we cancel. <laughs> we are certainly entitled to our authentic reaction to our emotions, be it anger, shock, defensiveness, but we are not entitled to take those feelings out on each other. Remember that our goal here is to help each other grow, and no one ever grew from shame. Only kindness can do that. Our congregational covenant doesn't say that we have to respond with grace and kindness the moment that something upsetting happens. It says to pause. Even if our impulse is to snap, we have a better chance of getting to a good resolution if we pause and approach the conversation later. Don't let the chance go by, but also don't go straight for the throat. Now, there's a great irony that in trying to make a wider circle, the specter of cancel culture looms large for some. If we cancel everyone who makes a mistake, there will eventually be no one left in the circle, not even ourselves. Mm -hmm. We are all capable of saying the wrong thing. It's easy to do. So let us put aside our fragility, our perfectionism, our preciousness, and our fear. If we are willing to be held accountable and grow, we have nothing to be afraid of. And as we do this work together, let us draw from a greater well of grace, mercy, compassion, and patience. Perhaps in this way, Unitarian Universalism will benefit from our own kind of Marian devotion. Let us meet each other with grace. Let us have mercy in the face of disappointment. Let us hold one another accountable with compassion and bear each other in patience as we learn, all of us, to be more inclusive.